Chapter 38, Isabella I will not allow you to do this. Wait until I get back before you do anything, I shouted at Gaspard. He was planning to announce Dante deceased. I pleaded with the board of the Cayman Roth conglomerate and Dante's mother before they declared him officially gone. The board was putting pressure on Dante's mother and Gaspard to move on from this. I refused to let that happen. After weeks of pleading, they finally agreed. Now it was up to me to bring him back home. My mother said I was acting irrationally. Yet, what was love but one irrational decision after another? If trying to find him was considered irrational, then so be it. Vast oceans and borders be damned. Everyone close to me gathered at my home to talk me out of it. Gaspard, Maya, Juliana, my mom, and Dr. Logan ambushed me. It was a coordinated trap they'd all planned to keep me from going. I would have none of it. My mind was made up. Nothing could stop me. Juliana, could you please reason with her, said Gaspard. With everyone in my home, it looked as if they'd all come together for an intervention. As if they were going to be successful in talking me out of this. I was dumbfounded when Maya called my mom after I told her I was going to find Dante myself. She was a snitch as far as I was concerned. The fact that my mother brought Dr. Logan to try and talk me out of this as well floored me. I had told them all before that nothing would stop me from going, though they didn't seem to want to listen. Isabella, please listen to me. It's been over five months now, and there's still no sign of him. Dante's charity fund and his company's search and rescue teams have been searching for him this whole time, and still nothing. There's a time when we have to accept the facts and try to move on, said Juliana. Maya looked at me and placed her hand on my shoulder. She's right. I've done everything I could to bring him home to you, but I failed. I'm so sorry that we weren't able to find him, said Gaspard. That's because you all stopped looking. Isabella, please try to calm down, my mom interjected. I'm going, and there is nothing any of you can do to stop me. Listen, Isabella, he's gone. I know it's hard, maybe even impossible to understand, but you have to accept that, Maya said. Don't you say that, I exclaimed. He's gone, Izzy, my mom said. I'm sorry, I really am, but I don't want you to end up missing right along with him. You are my only child, and I don't want to lose you too. Maybe I won't find him. Maybe I'll die in my attempts to find him. If that's what fate has in store for me, then I'll accept it. What I won't accept is sitting here doing nothing while there is even the slightest possibility that Dante is lost somewhere down there, waiting to be found. Isabella. He's alive! I, I just have to find him. My eyes began to water. Go, go, Isabella. You go, and you find him, said Dr. Logan. Everyone in the room inhaled deeply with shock as they turned their attention toward her. What in the world are you talking about? said Maya. She's been tormented because of the loss of this man. I can see in her eyes that she will never give up until she has closure. I'm not speaking as your therapist. I'm speaking as your friend. If you feel the need to go and look for him yourself, then that's exactly what you should do. Leave no stone unturned. Dr. Logan, please don't encourage her, said my mother. No, she's right, said Maya to my surprise. I look into her eyes and I don't see the same person I saw nine months ago. To tell you the truth, I don't see the same person I saw when Dante wasn't even in the picture. She's changed. Her whole outlook on life has changed. I want the old Isabella back. And if traveling to South America to find the love of your life will make that happen, then let's do it. I'll go with you. My eyes lit up with hope upon hearing her say that. Maya, who will run the company if both you and Isabella leave? Asked Juliana. She's right, Maya. I'll have to go alone. I'll hire a private search and rescue team when I get there. You're really serious about this, aren't you? You're really going to go? My mother asked. Yes, I'm dead serious, I bellowed. Do you have any idea how large the Amazon Basin is? You'll be searching for months. Do you even know which country in the Amazon he crash-landed in? His helicopter was found in Brazil, but they've searched all the rainforest in that area already. I'll just have to look a bit harder. I don't care what it takes. I have to find him, Mom. I have to. But why, sweetie? Because I love him, I whispered. That might have been the first time I had shown this much emotion over a man to my mother. Not even Nathan could get me to express this much passion. I hoped she could see how feverent I was about this, and how deeply I felt for him. In all my years, I have never seen any woman love him with such intensity as you do. You have my full support, 
Anything you need. Connections, travel consultants, funds, anything. Just ask, said Gaspard. I smiled a little. It was a relief to have a few of them support me. Thank you, Gaspard. Even if his board members refused to go on with the search, Gaspard and Dante's mother still had the final say. If he were declared dead, all of his holdings would transfer to Gaspard, until arrangements were made to shift responsibilities to Dante's first cousin Felix, who was living in New South Wales, Newcastle. When I'd spoken to him a few weeks ago, he seemed completely uninterested in running the company, and would most likely allow it to be broken up and sold off. He was more than happy to hear that I wanted to continue the search. If it weren't for my pleading, their board would have given up on the search months before now. I thought Felix wanted Dante to be found just as much as I did. If we did find him, then he wouldn't have to take on the responsibility of running the company. Felix was already wealthy in his own right, and wanted to continue to live the life of a carefree playboy. And that was fine by me. What I didn't understand was his sheer laziness in not wanting to help me in the search. Why Dante would leave him in charge was lost on me. I guessed he was the only kin Dante had. With nothing else left to say, Dr. Logan excused herself. I offered for her to stay in my condo and put one of my many rooms I had to use, but she declined. She wanted to get back to Florida as soon as she could. Juliana was secure in the knowledge that Maya would still be around to run the company in my absence. I hated leaving Maya here to shoulder much of the burden of the everyday corporate responsibilities. I hoped she would forgive me just this once. Ariel and Cam Cosmetics had grown substantially in the last year, and with the expansion of our field offices in Europe coming about, I felt that maybe I should stay until they were completed. But that would take too long. Every moment that passed was a moment Dante could be in danger. I had to go. Now. The sooner the better. I would try to be available via Skype and email as much as I could. My location in the rainforest and jungles of South America might make that impossible, but I'd give it my best. I promised my mother I wouldn't do anything that would put my life at risk. Everyone in the room walked up to me for a hug before leaving. I wish you luck in your endeavors, Isabella. And by the way, your phone's vibrating, said Dr. Logan before she left. It was sitting on the couch next to Gaspard. I picked it up to find that the call was from an unknown number. I usually didn't answer unknown callers, but with all the drama happening to me since my divorce, I was hoping it was someone calling with good news. I answered the phone to a familiar voice. Hello, how are you going, he said. It was Felix. The man had been living in Australia for so long that he had picked up a thick accent. Where am I going, I asked. He sighed. No, how are you going? It's the same as saying how are you doing in Americanese, he joked. I curled my lip. How did you get my number? I have Dante's will here with me. It has all of your contact information in it. He must have made an impression since he's included you in his will. I was floored. Dante never told me about his will. He certainly never told me he had included me in it. I had no idea, I exclaimed. Yes, well, he did. I thought you might want to know. I stared into space for a few seconds. Whether I was in his will or not didn't matter, because he wasn't dead. I was going to find him. Was that the only reason you called? No, it isn't. The board told me last week that they're giving up on the search. Just because he's missing doesn't mean that he's dead. You feel the same way, yes? Yes, of course, we talked about this already. I wondered where he could be going with this. I waved to Gaspard to keep him from leaving. Felix is on the phone, I whispered. Gaspard's face wrinkled at the very mention of his name. I didn't know what bad blood those two had with one another, but if he was talking about getting Dante back to me, then I was all ears. Are you going to help me look for him? I can't. I'm too busy to go out searching the wilderness for my cousin. The only thing I'm concerned with is bringing him back safely, so I may go on with my life and not have to worry about managing that business of his. If he's alive, then I'm off the hook. So, why are you calling if you're not going to help? I grew suspicious. I never said I wasn't going to help, I just said I wasn't going to go looking for him personally. If you truly love him and you want him to be brought back home safely, then you'll accept my gift. A gift? What gift? Where was he going with this? I called in a favor to my friend in the Royal Navy in the UK. They agreed to help you in the search. Dante had his hands in many dealings around the globe, and a lot of people depend on him. His life has had a positive impact on many world leaders. The last thing any of them want is to see me in charge of the Cayman Roth conglomerate. If you're willing, they'll help you find him. I couldn't believe it. This was exactly what I needed to hear. What a godsend this was. 
This is amazing, Felix. Don't thank me. Just find him. Check your email. Your contact will be Commodore William Noah. I'll leave the rest to you. He hung up without saying goodbye. I turned to Gaspard and told him what Felix just said to me. Are you serious? He asked. A dumbfounded look came over him. Gaspard was in apparent shock that Felix would do anything to help anyone but himself. I guessed in a way he was helping himself by supporting me. I just hoped it wasn't too late. I leaped to my computer sitting on my kitchen table to check my email. He wasn't kidding. All the information I needed to get in touch with Commodore Noah was there. How Felix got my email address, I didn't know, but I was grateful for it. Don't trust that guy, said Gaspard. I spun around in my chair to face him. Why not? He just gave me everything I needed. Gaspard joined me in the kitchen along with Maya and my mother. You'd be wise not to trust Felix, Isabella. He isn't everything he seems. He's an exceptionally gifted hacker who's allowed his many business talents to go to waste. Instead of joining Dante and consolidating many of his IT businesses, he decided to go off on his own and hack government systems for profit. I also heard he's done jobs for organized crime factions around the globe. I have no idea why Dante made him his beneficiary. In all honesty, Felix was the last person who needed to be in charge of this empire Dante's built. I don't know how he got a naval officer to help, but be sure to take his assistance sparingly, he warned. Maya and my mom went back into the living room with tea. Are you sure about this, sweetie? My mom said. I thought about what Gaspard had just told me and stared into my mom's eyes from across the room. There still wasn't any doubt about me going. I'll be safe, mom. I'll take every precaution. They promise. I went back into the living room where she hugged me again. She had never seen me like this, which was why she was so afraid I might do something reckless. I would never do anything that put my safety in jeopardy. Not only for my sake, but for the people who depended on me. And for Dante. My mom kissed my forehead. I love you, sweetie, she said. Everyone had already left, but my family and Gaspard. He still had a suspicious look about him after Felix's call. Come sit and have some tea, Gaspard. I'm sure nothing is menacing about Felix wanting to help. I tried to lighten his mood. No, I'm fine. I should be getting back to New York. I wish you luck. Maya, Mrs. Cam, enjoy the rest of your day. He saw his way out. I went back over to my computer to review the information Felix sent me, while Maya and my mom continued to give me worried glances. I heaved a sigh. I'll be okay. There's no need to worry. My mom sat back into the couch and drank her tea. I hope so, sweetie. I hope so. Chapter 39 Isabella Day 3 of the search, and I never thought it would be this hot and humid out here. Despite the urging of the Commodore to stay behind, I decided to come along so I could get a grasp of how hard it could be to find someone in this terrain. It was crazy to think someone could survive out here this long, but my faith in Dante was unrelenting and true. I knew he was out here. I just had to see this through. Watch out for the snakes, ma'am. They get pretty big here, said one of the guides assigned to me. The helicopters above us made it difficult for me to hear most of what was being said. The midshipman in charge told me the pilot would be flying out a few miles ahead to expand the search. As beautiful as the scenery around here might have been, I was in no hurry to set up camp. The bugs alone were irking me. I felt as if I were the main dish in their 12-course meal. The mosquitoes wouldn't stop until they had poked every inch of my body. The bug repellent I brought was useless, and I was about five seconds from covering myself in mud to keep them off. With my hands flailing about in every direction, the only thing I heard was to hold still before the guide blasted me with a wide spray of misty smoke. I started to gag on it before he stopped. Are you alright now, ma'am? asked the guide, holding a tubular device inches away from my face. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? I exclaimed. I coughed and coughed. It was for the bugs, ma'am, he assured me. Before I could get too angry, I noticed the mosquitoes had stopped swarming me. He stood there with a satisfied look as if he'd been waiting all day to spray me with whatever that stuff was. You should be okay now, ma'am, he said with a smirk. I was grateful and pissed at the same time. He could have given me a warning before spraying me. Or better yet, he could have given it to me before we left the boat so I could do it myself. Either way, the bugs had stopped feasting on me. And now I could continue with the search. Just as I was about to feel a bit of comfort in this green pond of mud and water we were walking through, something landed right on my shoulder. I felt as if I were in one of those horror movies where the guy who was about to be killed was arguing with his friends on what to do next, only to find the monster was right behind him. His friends would look terrified, and he knew in his gut that the beast was there. 
ready to devour his soul. I looked at my shoulder and there it was, with its long legs and hideous looking fangs. If I had to guess, I would assume it was one of those things that stuck to your face to implant an alien in your chest. A face hugger was what they're called, I thought. Why did everything in this jungle want to kill me? Horror filled the depths of my soul as it motioned its fangs toward my face. Oh my god! What is it? Get it off! Get it off! Get it off! I screamed, running around in circles before tripping over a branch stuck to the bottom of the pond. I landed face first into the mud, and the creature migrated to the top of my head to keep from getting wet. I shook with fear, hoping this thing didn't kill me. It's alright, ma'am. It's just a whip spider. They're harmless to humans, said one of the locals with us. I damn near fainted. There is nothing all right about a freaking whip spider. For the love of all that is good and holy, get it off! He took it off my head and threw it back into the trees. Still, my heart was beating fast as hell as I whipped away the mud from my eyes and face. I hadn't even been out here two hours, and I was already filthy and had bugs trying to kill me. Of all the places that spider could have landed, it just had to be my shoulder. Are you sure you don't want to head back? We can continue without you, said the midshipman. Did he think I was some kind of coward who couldn't hack it out out here? Granted, the spider had gotten the better of me, but I could press on as far as I needed to if it meant I could find Dante myself. I'm alright. Let's go, I said, walking past him. Hours into the day's search and walking this endless river, one of the locals signaled at us, waving his hands back and forth as if he'd found something. We ran over to his location, where he pointed across the lake, shouting in Portuguese. It looked like a piece of a torn parachute that had been shredded by the elements. We went to investigate, and found two shoes next to the fragmented parachute. This area was miles from the crash site. Could the wind have carried him this far when he jumped out? Or maybe this stuff belonged to someone else. I didn't want to get my hopes up. They began to examine the fragments, and I said a prayer they didn't find any limbs or a body. This stuff has been out here a while, and it could very well belong to Dante, said the midshipman. I headed over to see if I could recognize anything from the rubble. Look, there! The Cayman Roth logo on the part of the parachute that's torn. You see it? I pointed out enthusiastically. This was definitely his stuff. I was sure of it. You're right. How could the initial search teams have missed this, he said. Regardless of what they did, this find gave me hope that he was out there somewhere, and we were getting closer. Look for body parts, shouted one of the locals. Body parts? Insensitive prick! What do you mean, body parts? I bellowed. He mumbled something in his native tongue and rejoined the group. Listen, everyone, we don't have much sunlight left. We should head to the extraction point and we'll pick up the search tomorrow, said the midshipman. He was right. They didn't want to start the search so late in the day, but I insisted. Whatever sunlight we had, I was going to make the best of it. In any case, it was getting dark and the last thing I wanted was to be out here at night. I need everyone to gather all the stuff we found. If it's Dante's, then I want it, I requested. They thought it was all useless junk, but it wasn't to me. If it belonged to Dante, then I was keeping it regardless. We headed back to the rendezvous for pickup. It was nearly dark, and I sure as hell did not want to be out here when the sun went down. That spider thing might come after me again to finish the job. Chapter 40, Isabella. The Commodore thought it would be a good idea for me to stay ashore for the rest of the searches. The Amazonian forest was a beautiful place. I could only hope this place hadn't done to Dante what I feared. So far, they had been able to find more wreckage from his crash that drifted some miles away from the original site. The land masses here were plentiful, and there was no doubt in my mind he could have survived out here. When they did find him, I wanted to be the first person from civilization he saw. During our dinner date in Seoul, he told me about his time in the Boy Scouts and his year-long travels with survivalists after he graduated college. Perhaps that was a reason he decided to survey this area himself. Maybe he missed nature. I just hoped nature hadn't claimed him. Whatever survival training he'd received, I expected would do him great good. This was my first time in Brazil, and my Portuguese was sparse to non-existent. When I first arrived and met with the Commodore, he took me out on the initial search runs. He had ships looking around the riverbanks, while most of the other searches flew overhead by helicopter, looking for signs of life through the fog. If he was still alive, he would have at least tried to make a fire to keep himself warm. It had been a week and so far nothing. I was still confident nonetheless. If he had been ejected from his helicopter, 
then I was sure he wouldn't be anywhere near his original crash site. Maybe the wind blew him further out when the storm hit. The locals I'd brought out here to help me in the search had been kind to me so far, except that one guy in a sly comment about Dante's body parts. I told them I would pay quadruple their pay if they found him, whether he was alive or… or gone. I didn't even want to say the words. I refused to let them slip from my lips. He was alive, and I knew it. I could feel him in my bones. He was calling for me, just waiting to be found. I got frequent reports, at least once every five hours by my request, on the status of the search. They found things the initial surveys by Gaspar didn't notice. I could only surmise that they didn't bother to look inside the forest areas where he'd most likely be. It was starting to seem as though they were more concerned with finding the wreckage than human remains. I should have come out here months ago. It was 3am, and I couldn't sleep. All I did was sit by my radio waiting for the latest update, hoping for them to say they'd found him and he was alive. I'd never asked fate for anything my entire life, but if fate could bring him back to me, I would forever be in its debt. I could hear the searchers on the radio, various channels opened by my side, as they scrambled through the wilderness looking for clues and wreckage. As I nodded off, despite my best efforts to stay awake, I heard someone on one of the radio frequencies scream. I found something, but it doesn't look like it's breathing, they said. I nearly jumped out of my skin, eyes wide. I listened closely, trying to figure out what was going on, but most of what they were saying was in Portuguese. What is it? What happened? I screamed over the radio. Shivers overcame me while I waited for a response. Ten minutes, then fifteen minutes, and now twenty. Still no answer. What the hell did you find? Someone answer me! I was growing restless. It's here! I heard shouted repeatedly. My heart beat faster as I readied myself to go out on the next boat to see what was going on. They found him. They finally found him. I had to go now. Calm down, everyone. It's just a dead alligator, said one of the British officers on the same frequency. My heart sank into my stomach. I grabbed the radio next to my cot and started screaming in a fit of rage. Do you know what you did? Do you have any idea what the hell you just did to me? Hello? Do you copy? Who's on this frequency? Over. It's Isabella Cam, the reason you're out here. I tried to calm myself, but the frustration got the better of me. Sorry, ma'am. We didn't know you were listening. We thought you were asleep. Of course I'm listening. I'm always listening. Don't do that to me again. I thought you found him. I threw the radio on the floor and fought back tears. I was an emotional wreck. How was I to sleep now with my heart racing? I couldn't believe these people. Going berserk over a damned alligator. I went downstairs to the bar to have a drink. Maybe that would calm my nerves a bit. Everyone was sleeping, and there was no one tending the bar. So I went ahead and fixed myself something. It wasn't uncommon for people around here to mix their own drinks. I decided to purchase this little bar so I could be alone and drink by myself. The last thing I needed was to be surrounded by drunkards who liked to hit on me in their off hours. I didn't feel the need to bring any bodyguards due to most of the locals here being somewhat friendly. It was now 3.45 a.m., and since I had been here, I'd probably had a total of ten hours of sleep a night. I was always hoping this would be the day they found him. I felt as though I was driving myself mad, as if I was obsessed. Was this what love was? An obsession to find someone even when they can't be found? Had I been deceiving myself these last two years? Maybe everyone was right. Maybe Dante was dead. How could I have allowed fate to take him from me? I should have been by his side from the day he told me he loved me. I held my love for him just as long as he had kept his for me. Two years, he waited for me to leave my husband, and come to think of it, he'd loved me his whole life, since we were children. Nothing could tear our obsession for one another apart. If I did find him and he was alive, I would never leave his side again. I would love him, and only him, until death graced its cold fingers upon me, taking me to the hereafter. I swore it. Do you really mean that? said a familiar voice from behind me. As stupefied as I was to who it could have been, deep in my gut I knew it couldn't possibly be him. I'd rather confront that spider again than him. I turned around, but I was stopped when he put his arms around my neck and whispered in my ear. It was him. He smelled like embalming fluid, and his breath was much worse. This couldn't be real. How the hell was he here? I tried to wiggle my way out of his clutches, but his stench had me partially paralyzed. I wanted to bite his hand, but I couldn't. 
I wouldn't allow whatever disgusting filth he bathed in to enter my mouth. I pulled his arm from around my mouth and scratched at his face. Nathan! I screamed, hoping someone upstairs would hear me. He released me and pushed me onto the floor. <laughs> you are so predictable. I knew. I knew. I knew. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, I knew you would. Shh. Shh. You didn't really think I would let you go that easily, did you? Foolish little girl, he rambled. I didn't know if he was drunk or high. He looked as if his mind had fallen into complete insanity. He'd grown an unkempt beard and his hair was greasy. The clothes he wore were dirty and covered in holes. He had the appearance of a homeless meth addict. How did you find me? I asked, trembling. He rolled his tongue at me and smiled. I've been waiting here for four months. I saw in the news that one of the world's wealthiest men went missing in the Amazon. It didn't take me long to put two and two together. I also knew it would only be a matter of time before you came looking for him yourself. Now you're mine again, bitch. Get the hell away from me, Nathan, I said, inching my way closer to the door. He advanced with each motion I took. You see, I came here thinking you would be looking for your long-lost business partner. I never suspected that you were in love with him. That's right, I heard you whispering to yourself just now. You're in love with him, aren't you? Yes, I am. He's more of a man than you could ever dream to be. Oh, really? Then it's a real shame that your real man is dead. <laughs> He's dead, Isabella. Get it through your thick skull. He's dead. Dead. No, he's not dead. I'll find him. You silly little bitch. There is so much you simply do not know. You see, Isabella, I know he's dead. He began to laugh like a psycho. How do you know? I shot him a frightful glare. He snickered. Because I killed him. I rigged his helicopter just as I rigged the beams on the ceiling that broke his wrist. That's right, whore. I killed him. Rage engulfed me, and it felt as if my flesh was melting from my bones. No! I screamed before the bar attendant woke me. He looked just as bewildered as I felt, with my heart racing, arms flailing about. He stood there, staring at me as if I were crazy. It was a dream. The whole thing was a damn dream. Words could not describe the strange emotions swirling around my head right then. For a second, I thought I was being tortured in Nathan's pain room. I simmered down a bit and turned to the attendant. He was now afraid to come near me. How long was I asleep? I I'm not sure. Two, two days, he said, stuttering. Two days, I exclaimed. No, 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 I, I mean t t two, two hours. That's how you say hours, he said in broken English. I sighed in relief. I'm sorry if I frightened you, I said. He looked at me strangely. I wasn't sure if he fully understood what I meant. I walked back upstairs to my room to get some real sleep. I planned to sleep half the day away with my radio next to my bed, just in case they found him. As exhausted as I was, I still couldn't bring myself to stop worrying about this whole situation. Every day I hoped would be the day a miracle struck. The day he would walk through the door covered in mud, tired, and grateful to be alive. The day he would thank me for never giving up hope. I longed for that day. Words could not describe how much I longed for it.